Batteries are a cornerstone of our modern technological world, powering everything from tiny hearing aids to cell phones to entire vehicles. But how is it possible to squeeze power into such a small, convenient package? And who is the first person to discover this endlessly versatile bit of electrochemical wizardry? To begin with, the term battery actually predates the device it is now commonly associated with by several decades. In 1749, celebrated kite flyer, founding father, and hilarious horn dog extraordinaire Benjamin Franklin, incidentally whose old mistress's letter to a young friend on why old women are the best to sleep with is both amusing and also chock full of the sort of practical reasoning and wisdom you'd expect from one of history's greatest minds. We'll discuss this more in the bonus facts at the end of this video. But when it comes to batteries, Franklin used the word battery to refer to a bank of connected Leiden jars, borrowing a military term for a group of cannons firing together. Named after the University of Leiden in the Netherlands where it was invented in 1744, the Leiden jar was an early form of capacitor which could store a large charge of static electricity, such as that generated by a hand crank Wimschers machine. However, the Leiden jar could only discharge its electricity in a single short burst, making it of limited practical utility. The first electrical battery as we recognize it today would not be invented for another half century, inspired by, strangely enough, a dead frog. In 1786, Luigi Galvani, an Italian physician working at the University of Bologna, was conducting dissections of frogs when he noticed an odd phenomenon. When he touched a pair of frogs' legs with a steel dissecting tool while they were hanging from a brass hook, the legs twitched as if alive. Further experiments revealed that the frog legs and those of other animals also twitched involuntarily when subjected to electrical jolts from electrostatic machines and Leiden jars. This all led Galvani to believe he had discovered animal electricity, the very spark of life itself. And if all this sounds familiar, the electrical experiments of Galvani and others during this period directly influenced Mary Shelley's classic 1818 novel Frankenstein. Many scientists, however, were skeptical of Galvani's animal electricity theory among them being Italian physicist and chemist Alessandro Volta. Volta suspected the electricity which made the frog legs twitch came not from the frog tissue itself, but rather from a chemical reaction between the tissue and Galvani's metal dissecting tools. To test his hypothesis, Volta conducted a series of experiments in which he touched frog legs with tools composed of the same metal and connected the muscles of one frog to the nerves of another. In all cases, the legs did not twitch. To further prove his point, in 1800, Volta used the principles he discovered in his earlier experiments to construct the world's first chemical battery. Known as a voltaic pile, the device consisted of a stack of alternating copper and zinc discs separated by cardboard discs soaked in either salt water or diluted sulfuric acid. By connecting wires to both ends of the pile, Volta could create a weak but continuous electric current. Interestingly, the design of the pile was inspired by the anatomy of the Torpedo Nobilana, a type of ray known to produce powerful jolts of electricity to stun its prey. But while the torpedo ray's electric organs do indeed consist of multiple stack structures called electrocytes, the process by which these produce electricity is entirely different to that of Volta's pile. Volta's breakthrough took the scientific world by storm, earning him multiple awards and even an audience with Emperor Napoleon I. Despite this, however, Volta did not actually understand how his invention worked. According to Volta's now discredited theory of contact tension, the electric charge was created by the mechanical contact between the electrodes and not by a chemical reaction, with a rapid corrosion observed on the zinc discs being a defect unrelated to the operation of the pile. We now know, however, that the batteries work on the principle of galvanic cell, which harnesses the electric current produced by an oxidation, reduction, or redox reaction between two different metals. Different metals have different electrode potentials or affinities for electrons. Thus, when two different metals are placed in contact with each other and immersed in a conductive fluid or electrolyte, the less reactive metal, the cathode, will steal electrons from the more reactive metal, the anode. This generates positive ions of the anode material which leach away into the electrolyte, eventually causing the anode to dissolve. This process is known as galvanic corrosion and is the reason structures used in wet environments, like the hulls of ships, cannot be built from different metals placed in close contact. Conversely, this phenomenon can actually be used to protect such structures. For example, steel pipe and fencing is often galvanized or covered in a thin layer of zinc. As zinc is the more reactive metal, with an electrode potential of negative 0.76 volts compared to negative 0.04 volts from iron, the coating will corrode preferentially, leaving the pipe untouched. 
Similarly, ships are often fitted with so-called sacrificial anodes made of aluminum, magnesium, or zinc, which corrode in place of the hull. Ordinarily, the electrons transferred in such reactions pass directly from the anode to the cathode, the energy being dissipated as heat. If, however, the anode and the cathode are separated to create a galvanic or voltic cell, the electrons flowing between them can be drawn off to create a useful electric current. To allow positive ions to flow and complete the circuit, the two electrodes are separated by a semi-permeable membrane or salt bridge. If you have ever made a simple battery using a lemon, a piece of copper, and a piece of zinc, the copper is the cathode, the zinc is the anode, the lemon juice the electrolyte, and the flesh of the lemon itself is the membrane. As zinc has an electrode potential of negative 0.76 volts and copper 0.159 volts, such a battery will have a theoretical voltage of around 0.9 volts. The higher the potential gap between the electrode metals, the higher the output voltage. Though in practice, the actual output voltage will be lower than the theoretical voltage due to the internal resistance of the battery itself. It is also important to note here that while over time the term battery has expanded to include single galvanic cells, strictly speaking a battery consists of multiple cells. Pioneering though it was, Volta's first pile suffered from a number of drawbacks. It had a very low battery life of just a few hours, suffered from frequent short circuits caused by electrolyte leaking from cardboard discs, and current running through the electrolyte electrolysized the water and caused a film of hydrogen bubbles to form over the copper discs, causing internal resistance that gradually increased. The second problem was solved by Scottish scientist William Cruikshank by mounting the electrodes vertically in a box, an arrangement known as a trough battery. These batteries provided the first reliable source of electric power for scientists and were instrumental in a number of important scientific discoveries. For example, in 1807, English scientist Sir Humphrey Davy used a giant bank of 2,000 voltic cells to electrolyze molten potash and soda ash, leading to the discovery of the alkali metals potassium and sodium. These early batteries, however, were cumbersome, leaky, and unsuited for use outside of the laboratory. The first truly practical battery, the Daniel cell, was invented in 1836 by British chemist John Daniel. The cell consisted of a copper pot filled with a copper sulfate solution, into which was inserted an unglazed ceramic pot filled with sulfuric acid or zinc sulfate, and a zinc electrode. The ceramic pot acted as a semi-permeable membrane to allow sulfate ions to flow between the electrodes, while the use of the two electrolytes allowed the hydrogen produced in one half of the cell to be consumed in the other, eliminating yet another problem that plagued Volta's original pile. The Daniel cell, as well as derivatives like the gravity cell and the bird cell, soon became the standard battery for use in the telegraphic network, and in 1881 chosen as the basis for defining the volt, the standard unit of electrical potential named in honor of Alessandro Volta. By the modern definition, however, the battery produced a voltage of around 1.1 volts. The next major development in battery technology, and the ancestor of the compact batteries we use every day, was the Leclanche cell, invented in 1866 by French inventor Georges Leclanche. Using a zinc anode, manganese dioxide cathode, and an ammonium chloride electrolyte, the Leclanche cell produced 1.4 volts and quickly replaced the Daniel cell for use in telegraph and telephone networks. However, just like previous batteries, due to its liquid electrolyte, the Leclanche the cell was prone to spillage, requiring frequent top-ups and other maintenance, and was not easily portable. In 1886, German inventor Karl Gassner solved this problem by replacing the liquid electrolyte with a paste-like mixture of ammonium chloride, plaster of Paris, and zinc chloride. This was combined with a carbon rod cathode and sealed in a zinc can that doubled as the anode, creating the first truly portable dry cell battery. Patented in 1887, the zinc carbon battery was first mass produced in 1896 by the National Carbon Company as the Columbia Dry Cell, which in 1899 inspired British inventor David Missile to create the first electric flashlight, a device that would have been impossible, or at least highly inconvenient, without Carl Gassner's breakthrough. For the first six decades of their development, all batteries were what were known as primary batteries, meaning that they eventually consumed their internal chemicals and could only be used once before being discarded or completely rebuilt. In 1859, however, French inventor Gaston Planté invented the lead acid cell, the world's first secondary or rechargeable battery. This device used an anode of solid lead and a cathode of lead dioxide immersed in a sulfuric acid electrolyte. Both electrodes reacted with the electrolyte to produce lead sulfite, only the lead anode released electrons while the lead dioxide cathode consumed them, causing a current to flow between them. Eventually, most of the sulfuric acid is removed from the electrolyte, leaving mostly water, while both electrodes become coated in lead sulfate. This all causes the reaction to stop and the battery to run down. 
If, however, a reverse current is passed through the battery, the lead sulfate on the anode is decomposed back into lead and sulfuric acid, restoring the battery to its former state and allowing it to be used again. This style of battery is still used more than 160 years later in nearly every motor vehicle. The lead acid battery was followed in 1899 by the nickel cadmium battery invented by Swedish engineer Valdemir Junger, and in 1900 by the nickel iron battery invented by Thomas Edison. Edison created his battery to serve the then thriving electric car market. Incidentally on this one, something that may come as a surprise to many today is that until Henry Ford did his thing, the electric car for a little while was king of the road. And Ford's wife, Clara, even drove one, the Detroit Electric, which had an astonishing 80 mile range, instead of driving in one of her husband's company's cars. In any event, going back to Edison's battery, while it was cheaper than Junger's design, it had a low life, long charging period, and due to emitting hydrogen could not be sealed, making it prone to leakage. Though Edison eventually produced an improved design in 1910, by then affordable gasoline powered cars like the Ford Model T had largely driven electric cars off the market. But that is a story for another video. In addition to still being one of the most common rechargeable batteries in use today, Waldemar Younger's nickel cadmium design was also the world's first alkaline battery, using an alkaline potassium hydroxide electrolyte instead of an acid. However, the acidic zinc carbon cell would continue to dominate the portable flashlight battery market until the late 1950s, when Canadian engineer Louis Urey, working for Union Carbine in Cleveland, Ohio, combined the basic design of the zinc carbon battery with an alkaline manganese dioxide paste electrolyte. First marketed in 1959, this design would go on to form the basis for the most popular types of consumer batteries in use today. And in case you're wondering why we have AA, AAA, C, and D batteries, but there seems to be no B batteries, we'll get into this in the bonus facts shortly. But in any event, while dozens of other specialized battery types have been developed over the years, perhaps the most important is the lithium ion battery, which underpins countless modern technologies from cell phones to drones to electric cars. Theoretically, lithium is the ideal metal with which to make a battery. Not only is it the lightest of all metals, but with the exception of the highly dangerous alkali metals sodium, potassium, rubidium, cesium, and francium, also has the lowest electrode potential of negative 3.04 volts, giving it the highest energy density of any practical metal. In a typical lithium ion battery, the anode is made up of lithiated carbon in the form of graphite, the cathode from lithium cobalt oxide, and the electrolyte from lithium salt solution. As lithium reacts violently with water and oxygen to produce hydrogen gas and heat, the electrolyte solvent must be non-aqueous and the battery case must be tightly sealed to prevent leakage. During discharge, oxidation of the anode released electrons, which are drawn off as electric current, and lithium ions which travel through the electrolyte and are deposited on the cathode. During discharge, oxidation of the anode releases electrons, which are drawn off as electric current, which travel through the electrolyte and are deposited on the cathode. Once the battery is run down, a reverse current can be applied, causing the lithium ions to migrate back towards the anode and recharging the battery. While inventors have been tinkering with lithium batteries since the 1910s, numerous problems had to be overcome to make the technology feasible, such as crystal growth causing internal short circuits or impurities causing batteries to spontaneously catch fire. Thus, it was not until the 1990s that the first practical lithium ion batteries appeared on the market. Incredibly, this breakthrough was considered so significant that in 2019, three of lithium ion batteries inventors, John Goodenow, Michael Whittingham, and Akira Yoshiro, were awarded the Nobel Prize in Chemistry for their efforts. And now how about some bonus facts? As alluded to, since the invention of the battery, there have been a pretty amazingly diverse number of battery types used with different sizes, shapes, voltages, storage capacities, etc., and also named a variety of things. This gave rise to the need for an industry-wide standard, particularly as the lack of international or even national standard during World War I was very problematic for the military. As such, after World War I, the War Industries Board and several other government agencies got together to try to come up with standard specifications for batteries. A few years later, in 1928, the American Standards Association, the predecessor to the American National Standards Institute, ANSI, officially adopted this proposal, introducing a list of battery cell sizes and their corresponding labels. For these labels, they used the suggested convention that A would be the smallest. As you went up in the letters, the batteries would get larger in size. There was also a number six battery that was the largest. This was just adopted as it had previously been one of the most popular battery cell sizes used, a six inch battery. So it was grandfathered in, though now given more strict guidelines to exact specifications. 
Others came along later, such as the AAA size, which wasn't adopted into the standard until 1959. Since then, the ANSI standard for batteries has been revised numerous times as battery technology has evolved, with some of the most popular you'll find on store shelves including AA, AAA, C, and D batteries. This might all have you wondering why no B batteries. Well, there actually are B batteries. It just appears there is no B or A, F, etc., simply because those particular battery sizes never really caught on commercially, at least on the consumer consumer end of things. Nowadays, because they're the most commonly available to consumers, most manufacturers continue to use AA, AAA, C, and D battery types over the many other sizes that are available to power their devices. However, B batteries are still made and sold and pack a decent punch for their size, producing 1.5 volts and 8,350 milliamps for the alkaline variety. For a reference, standard alkaline AA's ring in at 1.5 volts and 2,700 milliamps. Incidentally, single A batteries are also still in production, last most commonly used in early model laptop battery packs. F batteries, on the other hand, are still commonly used within something you can find at your local supermarket, rectangular 6 volt batteries. Moving on from batteries, as promised, we're now going to discuss why Ben Franklin states older women make the ideal mistresses. In a letter to an unknown friend struggling with horniness, Franklin begins by stating that, for a variety of reasons, taking a wife is the preferred method to resolve the issue, along with a number of other benefits, stating, it is the man and woman united that make the complete human being. Separate, she wants his force of body and strength of reason. He, her softness, sensibility, and acute discernment. Together, they are more likely to succeed in the world. A single man has not nearly the value he would have in that state of union. He is an incomplete animal. He resembles the odd half of a pair of scissors. However, as his unnamed friend had apparently objected to getting married at that point in life, he had also apparently wanted to know if Franklin knew of any medicine that might cure horniness, to which Franklin noted he did not know of one. And thus, if his young friend refused to take a wife, he should instead seek a mistress, and in Franklin's view, that in all of your amours you should prefer old women to young ones. He then goes on to list his reasons for this advice. To quote him, because as they have more knowledge of the world and their minds are better stored with observations, their conversation is more improving and more lastingly agreeable. Number two, because when women cease to be handsome, they study to be good. To maintain their influence over men, they supply the diminution of beauty by an augmentation of utility. They learn to do a thousand services small and great and are the most tender and useful of all friends when you are sick. Thus they continue amiable, and hence there is hardly such a thing to be found as an old woman who is not a good woman. Number three, because there is no hazard of children which irregularly produced may be attended with much inconvenience. Number four, because through more experience they are more prudent and discreet in conducting an intrigue to prevent suspicion. The commerce with them is therefore safer with regard to your reputation, and with regards to theirs, if the affair should happen to be known, considerate people might be rather inclined to excuse an old woman who would kindly take care of a young man form his manners by her good counsels and prevent his ruining his health and fortune among mercenary prostitutes. Number five, because in every animal that walks upright, the deficiency of fluids that fill the muscles appears first in the highest part. The face first grows lank and wrinkled, then the neck, then the breast and the arms. The lower parts continuing to the last as plump as ever, so that covering all above with a basket and regarding only what is below the girdle, it is impossible of two women to know an old from a young one. And as in the dark all cats are gray, the pleasure of corporal enjoyment with an old woman is at least equal and frequent superior, every knack being by practice capable of improvement. Number six, because the sin is less, the debauching a virgin may be her ruin and make her for life unhappy. Number seven, because the compunction is less, the having made a young girl miserable may give you frequent bitter reflections, none of which can attend the making an old woman happy. Number eight, thusly and lastly, they are so grateful. Speaking of being grateful, this is a new channel, so we'd be really grateful if you subscribed to it and checked out another one of our videos such as this one right here.